Hello, everyone, and welcome to Chapter 21, uh, Radioactivity and Nuclear Chemistry. This, personally, is one of my favorite chapters. I really like um, just how cool it is because nuclear chemistry really ends up breaking some of the rules that we've talked about um, you know, previously, where, like we said when we're balancing equations, if I start with five carbon atoms at the beginning of a reaction, I'm going to need five carbon atoms at the end of the reaction. And yet that's not true when it comes to nuclear chemistry. Um, I can actually have one atom become another one. It also is cool because nuclear chemistry actually allows for transmutation, which is something that the alchemists of old were always dreaming about, right? This idea of taking a, a base metal and turning it into gold. Um, so they've actually done this with nuclear reactors. It just so happens that the gold you create that way is far more expensive than just you know digging it up out of the ground, but still, it's just such a cool idea. All right, so... Let's go ahead and just start with some definitions. Not the most exciting part, but essential if we want to understand what's going on with um, nuclear chemistry. All right, so first off, we're going to be using the term isotope a lot. An isotope, if you remember um, from a previous lecture, is just an atom of the same element with a different number of neutrons. Okay, um, And so we're going to represent that in one of two ways. We can either go ahead and write it like this, where we've got a chlorine, right? And then the, in the top left-hand corner, we're going to go ahead and put the mass number, okay? That's the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. Down in the bottom corner, we're going to go ahead and put the <clears throat> Z, which is the atomic number, or the number of protons, okay? So pretty important right there. Now, I mentioned that there's another way to represent this, and this is much easier to type in if you're like writing in Microsoft Word or something. You would just write chlorine 35, okay? Now, if I write it like this, it does force me to go and pull out a periodic table because if I want to know the number of protons in here, I'd have to go to my periodic table. I'd see that chlorine is element number uh, 17, right? So it must have... 17 protons, okay? Now, um, number of neutrons, I can figure out by looking at this number right here. So if that's protons plus neutrons, so 35 uh, for my mass number minus, I've got um, 17 of those protons, so it must have 18 neutrons, right? Now, if I were to write it like this down here, it's a little easier because I automatically know, oh, I've got 17 protons. And then here, I'd still have to do a little bit of math. And I'd do 35 minus 17 equals 18 neutrons, OK? So a little more work. Um, but either one works, OK? Now, isotopes are interesting because um, they're kind of like flavors, right? I mean, think about there's multiple flavors of ice cream. Excuse me. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so the multiple flavors of ice cream. Same thing with our isotopes. I could have some different isotopes of carbon, for instance. Carbon happens to come in three varieties, three flavors, right? Three isotopes. And that happens to be carbon-12, carbon-13, or carbon-14. Okay, carbon-12 and carbon-13 um, are perfectly stable. Okay, they can last forever. Carbon-14, though, this is a... a what's called a radioisotope or a radioactive isotope. And so it's unstable. It wants to um, do something, give off some radioactive particles or energy in order to become stable. Okay. Now, there's no easy way to know right away if something's radioactive or not. There are some trends in stability that we could look at, um, looking at the number of neutrons to protons and looking at that ratio and so forth. But even that's not really a perfect solution. Um, but that's kind of the basic idea behind this is that we've got different varieties. They all have the exact same number of protons, right? So for instance, with carbon, all three would have six protons, but um, the number of neutrons would differ, okay? So here's another example of some of those radioisotopes. Um, hydrogen comes in three versions, okay? We've got just our normal hydrogen, okay? Which would have one proton, right? number of protons down here. All of them would still have one proton, okay? But they would differ in the number of neutrons. So here, I would have one minus one proton would actually be zero neutrons. Here, it would be two minus one 
would equal one neutron. And here it would be two, oh sorry, <laughs> can't count, three minus one would be two neutrons. So you can see that they do differ in the number of neutrons. These ones are interesting because hydrogen um, that has one neutron or a mass number of two, we actually call deuterium. And this one here with a mass number of three, we call tritium. Tritium happens to be highly radioactive. Uh, I think there is an old Spider-Man um, movie about them making a tritium bomb um, by taking you know, all the radioactive tritium and using that and so forth. Well, that's kind of the idea behind it. Okay, so I mentioned that these, um, these radioisotopes want to give off radiation. They want to shoot out little particles or energy in an effort to try to become stable. Okay, So um, what are the different types of radiation that they can give off? Well, the first one is called an alpha particle. Okay, So it's used, we use the Greek letter alpha for it. Um, but a better way to write it would be this right here, 4,2 helium. So what that means is that this is actually a helium nucleus. It contains two protons and two neutrons, right? Because if we look at that... That's our number of protons. Here we've got four minus two would equal our number of neutrons, okay, which would be two. Um, the other important thing about this is because it doesn't have any electrons, it's just the nucleus, it actually has a plus two charge. Now alpha particles, very, very powerful. Okay? They have the highest mass. I mean, on a, an atomic scale, having two protons and two neutrons shooting out of some other radioisotope, that's a pretty big you know, atomic bullet that's getting blown out of that thing, right? But because they're so large, they actually have the lowest penetrating power. So um, these can actually be stopped by a sheet of paper or a couple of in inches of air or the dead skin cells on your epidermis. So as long as um, alpha radiation sources are outside of you, not a big deal, right? I could have something that gives off alpha particles um, sitting on my shelf at work, and I wouldn't really worry about it because the air or even my dead skin or my clothing or anything is going to stop those alpha particles from damaging me. Okay. Now, on the other hand, if I were to ingest that, that would be a really big deal because now there's nothing between me and those alpha particles that are getting shot out of it, and um, I would end up dying of radiation poisoning, right? So, yeah, just don't eat them. Um, now, I always think of this as kind of like if I went out into my you know, neighbor's flower bed and I grabbed a bowling ball and I just chucked that bowling ball as far as I could throw it. It's probably not going to go very far because it's just so massive. It's heavy, right? And so um, it's not going to go very far, but whatever plant it lands on, it's going to pretty much demolish it, right? And so that's the same thing with alpha particles. They don't go very far, but when they do hit something, they can do a lot of damage just because they're so massive. All right, the second type of radiation that we need to worry about would be beta particles. Okay, beta particles are just high energy electrons that are actually ejected out of the nucleus itself. Okay, and this is kind of cool because just like a normal electron, it has a negative one charge. But what's interesting is that it's not just coming from the electron cloud that's floating around the atom. Um, instead, I'm actually taking a neutron. That neutron is breaking down and turning into a proton plus a beta particle which kind of makes sense. It actually explains some of the, the stuff um, that we learned about in a previous lecture about how neutrons actually weigh just a little bit more than protons do. And that's because you can think of a neutron as just a proton plus an electron just welded together. And because the proton is a plus one, and the electron's a negative one, um, that means that they are neutral when they come together and form a neutron, okay? So, um, these are interesting because they're kind of in the middle. They have a very small mass. It's negligible, but it does definitely have some mass. Um, but because of that, they have moderate penetrating power. So this would be like if I walked out into that flower bed and grabbed a baseball and chucked that baseball as far as I could. Right? It's going to go a lot further than a bowling ball. But when it hits something, it's probably not going to do as much damage as getting hit by a bowling ball, right? getting hit by an alpha particle. So beta particles... Um, definitely they, they can still do damage and they can get further in, they can penetrate further, but not as much damage as an alpha particle would do. When I was in graduate school, we would use a lot of radioactive phosphorus, um, P32, and that's a beta particle emitter. And so we would have to wear gloves and a lab coat, obviously safety goggles. But then um, when we did the reaction, we would always do it behind a little plexiglass shield. 
and it would just be like less than a centimeter of plexiglass, but that was enough that it would stop the beta particles. Okay. Whereas if I was using an alpha source, I wouldn't even worry because even just the, a few inches of air around it or, you know, um, you know, would stop all of it. Okay. Now, another interesting thing about beta particles is not only do some radioisotopes actually emit beta particles, but other radioisotopes will actually undergo electron capture, where the nucleus will actually grab onto an electron, pull it in, and go the opposite way. It'll convert one of its protons into a neutron in the process. All right, the next type is just a subset of our, um, our beta particles, and these are positrons. So positron or a beta plus is, it's antimatter, right? You've probably um, seen some sci-fi where they talk about antimatter. Well, it's real, right? So, and a positron is the antiparticle of an electron. So it has the same mass, but it has a positive charge, okay? And this could actually be formed by taking a proton and then uh, creating a neutron and a positron. Okay, kind of a, a weird thing, but it kind of makes sense because a positron's plus one charge and neutron's neutral, so overall you'd have a proton uh, with a plus one charge. These have the same mass as an electron, so pre pretty negligible, right? Um, moderate penetrating power, just like a, a beta particle would be because it has the same mass, the same energy. All right, so um, antimatter is interesting because when antimatter and matter come together, they annihilate each other and they produce a lot of energy. Um, so we don't see these a lot, but um, they do exist, right? If you go in for a PET scan at the hospital, positron emission tomography, they um, will inject you with something, um, I think it's glucose that happens to have a, a, a positron emitter in it that goes to your brain um, because your brain loves to eat glucose up. And so then it starts shooting out these positrons and then we can measure that. All right. Um, also, if you're a Star Trek The Next Generation fan, you remember that Lieutenant Commander Data's, um, you know, his brain is a positronic net instead of an electronic net because positron positrons are way cooler. All right. The next type would be our gamma rays. So gamma rays are just high energy photons. We know that photons really don't have, you know, mass, um, at least in the traditional sense, right? Um, so they're just energy. They also don't have a charge, uh, but they, because they have no mass, they can penetrate much, much further than any of the other types of radiation, right? So um, a, an alpha particle can be stopped by a sheet of paper, a beta particle by you know, a centimeter of plexiglass, a gamma ray has to be stopped by like a few meters of of concrete or you know like a foot of lead or something like that um, it's definitely much much um, harder to block these things this would be like me going out into my neighbor's flower bed with a you know a bb gun and just shooting that bb gun that bb is going to go much much further than either a baseball or a bowling ball but it's probably not going to do as much damage when it actually hits something right i hit uh, i don't know a raspberry bush with a bb probably not much is going to happen to it right so that's the same thing with gamma rays now, the reason that we typically worry about gamma rays, though, is because they're so hard to stop. So, um, you know, for instance, in my office, I have a bunch of, you know, radioactive material that I use for, you know, lectures and demos and stuff. And I keep it inside of a, a you know, plastic toolbox, and that blocks all alpha and beta emitters. I don't have to worry about it, right? I don't keep any gamma ray emitters in there because I wouldn't be able to stop them. They'd be shooting out all the time. And I don't want that, right? Okay, so just a little summary of these symbols that we've been using. So um, protons, we'll call that a P plus, and then we can write it as either you know, a, a hydrogen nucleus or a, you know, just a proton. Same thing with neutrons, we can write those out. Um, we've got our electrons, um, and then we've got beta and alpha and positrons and so forth. And then this doesn't mention gamma, but that's just a zero, zero gamma, okay? Now, I mentioned that I do like to collect a lot of weird radioactive stuff. So here's just a few things that I've collected throughout the years um, that are kind of interesting. So this is called Trinitite. This is from the first atomic bomb blast in Alamogordo, New Mexico back in 1945. They dropped this um, atomic bomb uh, out there in the desert and the atomic blast actually was so hot that it melted the desert sand into glass, radioactive glass. And so I've got some of that radioactive glass, um, still radioactive even today.
all right? Um, you probably have smoke detectors, hopefully, in your house or apartment, and that runs off of radioactive americium. So it's actually a really good thing because those it's an alpha particle emitter, and as those alpha particles get shot out of um, you know the little ionization chamber, it hits air, and it can actually have so much energy that it ionizes the air, which allows it to... Um, to carry a charge that connects the circuit and it keeps your um, smoke detector from going off. But if smoke or steam or whatever gets into that little chamber, then that blocks those alpha particles and that causes your smoke detector to start beeping. Okay, um, we also have, uh, back in the day, we would make clocks with radium in the paint. So here's an old clock I have from the 50s. Um, and it glows in the dark, right? Now this is different than what's called phosphorescence, which is where you've got like, I don't know, your favorite Ninja Turtle pajamas or whatever that happen to glow in the dark, where you go into, you know, stand in front of a, a bright light for a few minutes, and then you go into a dark room and it will glow for a while, okay? That's phosphorescence, that's not radioactivity. It's just the um, atoms absorbing those photons of light and then giving them off later on. Okay, radioactivity is different because um, with this clock, for instance, I can take that and put it in a dark room for 20 years and it will still continue to glow because what's actually happening is those, um, those I think it's a beta particle emitter, um, is hitting the zinc sulfide paint, um, which then causes the paint to phosphoresce, but it's the, the, those beta particles that are giving it the energy to do that. Now, you might think, why would we do that? I mean, it's horrible, and it really is. Um, you should read the book, The Radium Girls. It's also a movie now, I think. Um, horrible story where you know young women were working in these factories, painting these clocks. They would do something called tipping, right? So to get a fine tip on the brush, they would smooth it between their lips. But because the radium radioactive paint was on there, it would you know go into their body. And if you look at your periodic table, you'd see that radium is in the same column as calcium. And so your body, when it sees radium, thinks it's calcium. What does it do with calcium? Stores it in your bones and teeth. And it does the same thing with radium. Unfortunately, that radium then radioactively decays and starts just blowing apart your bones um, and just honeycombs them. They get super weak and you get bone cancer and leukemia and everything's just horrible. And these women died horrible, painful deaths. Um, on the bright side of it though, at least their deaths um, because of the lawsuits and things that followed, um, was one of the, the cases that helped to increase workplace safety, where the government said, you know, really, you can't expose people to radio radiation um, and not even tell them it's dangerous. Now, we also used to do really other stupid things, like, for instance, um, this Fiesta wear right here. The mango orange ones have uranium in the glaze. And so and that means that as it radioactively decays, it actually, you know, is giving you cancer, right? Now, they're alpha particle emitters, so as long as it's sitting on the shelf, you don't really have to worry about it, right? But if I were eating off of that, I would be worried because if I'm eating spaghetti, for instance, that you know, uh, the marinara sauce is acidic, that's going to leach some of that uranium out of the glaze, which I'm then consuming that, and now it's that alpha source is blasting apart the inside of me. Bad idea, right? Now, one thing that I should mention is that a lot of times, probably because of the media and Homer Simpson, you know, glowing green because he works at the power plant and so forth, um, a lot of people think that if you're exposed to radiation, it makes you radioactive. That's not true. And it really doesn't make sense if you think about it, right? If I, if I have this um, plate right here, okay, and I sit that, I sit, set it next to me on the table, um, it's like shooting these little radioactive bullets at me, these alpha particles. Those bullets can damage me, but it can't make me radioactive. It's like if I took a paintball gun and shot myself in the foot with it and said, look, I just turned my foot into a paintball gun. Doesn't make any sense, right? I could hurt my foot by shooting it, but it doesn't mean that my foot is now a paintball gun, right? It's not going to go and shoot out its own paintballs. So there are only really two ways to make something radioactive. One is that you actually ingest the radioactive source so if I were eating off of this plate here, um, now that uranium is inside of me, so it's the uranium that's shooting out those radioactive bullets, but now that's inside of me, so I am you know, technically radioactive. Or people who take um, you know, radioactive iodine to treat thyroid cancer, for instance, or an overactive thyroid gland. Um, 
they have to be very careful because now they are radioactive and as they excrete that iodine, they have to collect the waste and so forth. Uh, it's a little tricky. The other way that we can um, make something radioactive is to take it from a normal isotope, bombard it with neutrons, and then turn it into a radioisotope. And that's what they used to do back in the 50s and 60s at the American Museum of Atomic Energy. You take a dime out of your pocket, and back then the dimes were made of silver, you'd pop it into this little um, machine. The machine would then bombard it with neutrons. The dime would then kick into this lower chamber where um, a Geiger counter would start clicking like crazy and saying, hey, look, um, <laughs> you know, I really do have this radioactive dime. And then the machine would spit it out and you'd pick up that dime and stick it in your pocket next to your goods, and it's a bad idea, right? Um, so, you, or you could go and actually go to the gift shop and get this nice little fancy case for it, and then you could put it in that as well. So, in that case, again, um, not a really smart idea. They luckily don't do that anymore just for fun. Um, it's now used for things like forensic science. You can uh, bombard a sample with neutrons, like let's say a paint sample, and then watch as it radioactively decays, and then you can determine from that which isotopes you started out with. And so it can actually tell you exactly what trace elements are in a sample, which is kind of cool. Anyway, so um, different things that you might come across. All right, so what happens if you are exposed to radiation? Well, it turns out that you can't detect it, right? It's not like you walk into a room and your spider sense, sense starts tingling. Um, telling you that something's radioactive. But because it, um, these little radioactive bullets are being shot out of these radioisotopes, they can damage or kill cells, particularly rapidly dividing cells. So for instance, cancer cells, right? You have got cancer, you expose the tumor to radiation, hopefully it damages the cancer cells enough that they um, die, right? And hopefully it does that before you start damaging other cells. But if you also think about what are some of the symptoms of, you know, or side effects, I should say, of radiation um, treatment for cancer is that um, typically like your hair falls out, right? Because those hair follicles rapidly dividing cells. You, oftentimes your immune system goes way down because your bone marrow um, involves a lot of rapidly dividing cells that it uses for your immune system. You can become sterile, again, because your reproductive organs are producing lots of rapidly dividing cells. So it kind of makes sense um, that, you know, what those side effects would be. And of course, um, radiation can cause cancer, right? It can damage normal healthy cells and cause them to just start going crazy and um, growing uncontrollably and spreading and, you know, making cancer. Um, so it, it really is a double-edged sword. All right, um, what else? You can also, on a brighter side, you can use radiation to irradiate food. So let's say I've got some strawberries that I pick up at Walmart. And by the time I get them home, they're already starting to mold. It seems like they you know, grow mold really, really fast. Okay, Or I've got some, some lettuce from Chipotle or ground beef or something that I'm worried about has E. coli on. So what I can do is I can expose that food to gamma rays, which will kill any rapidly dividing cells like mold and bacteria. And because the food itself is dead, you know, it's not growing, so I don't have to worry about damaging the food itself. And, but now the food is much, much safer to eat. Okay, and remember this does not make the food itself radioactive, right? Um, it just makes it safer. In fact, I even have in my little uh, kit of radioactive stuff, I have a, a piece of mail that was um, sent through the Bridgeport, New Jersey um, post office back during the anthrax scare back in, uh, I don't even remember, like 2002 or something like that, um, where someone was mailing letters with anthrax in them. And so to kill off any anthrax spores that might have, you know, been, you know, contaminating the the postal system there, they just exposed all of the mail to gamma rays, and that would kill off any anthrax while not harming the letters or whatever that you have. Okay, so we're going to be learning how to balance nuclear reactions or nuclear equations, and I personally think this is way easier than balancing regular equations and way, way, way easier than balancing electrochemical or redox reactions. Remember, those were kind of a pain, right? So these are actually really easy to balance. So 
Um, what we're going to do is we're going to look at radioactive decay. So we're going to see a radioisotope that's going to emit radiation, and we're going to figure out what it makes, right? So we've got our original nucleus, and then it's going to create something new, and then it's also going to give off alpha, beta, gamma, something like that. So in order to do this, to balance a nuclear equation, all we have to do is we need to make sure that the sum of the mass numbers on both sides of the arrow is the same, and the sum of the atomic numbers on both sides of the arrow is the same. If those two things are equal, we have a balanced nuclear equation. Okay? We don't have to worry about um, counting atoms or anything like that. We don't have to worry about number of electrons or charges. We don't care. right? All we care about is simply the, um, the sum of those two numbers. So let's look at some examples. So uranium, like in my Fiesta Ware. So uranium undergoes alpha decay. So the, a problem might just say alpha right here, right? But you should automatically think 4,2 helium nucleus and write it like that. The reason for that is because now I can look at those top and bottom numbers. So these are my mass numbers. So on the top here, I've got a 238. Here I've got a 234 plus a 4. That adds up to 238. So that's the same, right? So that's balanced. Then I look at the bottom number. Here it's a 92 on the left-hand side of the arrow. On the right, it's a 90 plus a 2 equals 92. So that is a balanced nuclear equation because everything is the same, right? The sum of the mass number and the sum of the atomic numbers are equal. Now with beta, it's a little trickier just because there's a negative number in there, but adding a negative number is easy, right? It's just subtracting. So here I see that I've got a 14 on the top. Here it's 14 plus 0, right? Notice the little plus sign in between. It reminds you to add those two numbers together. So 14 plus 0 equals 14. That's a match, right? Okay, what about here? 6. Here I've got 7 plus a negative 1. 7 plus a negative 1 is equal to 6, right? So, it's a really crappy 6. All right, but that's a match, right? So that's a balanced equation. So always remember, you just take this number plus the other number, okay? Let's try another one, positron. So, oh, and I should mention, remember that a, a problem might just say beta instead, and you should automatically rewrite it as 0 minus 1e. E. It'll make your life much easier. Okay, what about a beta plus? So that's a positron. It's a 0 plus 1e, e, but I like to write it out because that way I can look at the top numbers, 11, 11 plus 0 equals 11, right? So that's a match. 6, and then here it's 5 plus 1 plus a positive 1, right? So that equals 6. It's a match. So that is a balanced equation, okay? Pretty simple, right? Like way easier than redox equations, easier than even just balancing normal equations. And we're going to practice some where I don't, you know, give you the, you know, the products and you'll have to figure it out. But all right, so this next one is technetium. This is used in cancer therapy and stuff. Um, technetium is called technetium because it was the first element that was created by technology. So it's the first man-made element, and um, so we call it technetium. Kind of cool. Happens to be radioactive. Doesn't exist in nature. But there's actually what's called a metastable isotope of it. So this is an isotope where it just has a little too much energy. So it's actually going to give off a gamma ray. Remember, gamma is just a 0, 0 gamma. So if I look at this, a 99 on top, 99 plus 0 equals 99. On the bottom, I've got, oh, I should use another color, I've got a 43. Looks like 43 plus 0, if I use my amazing mental math, comes out to exactly 43. So again, it's a match. Now, the only difference between this is I still have technetium, but um, I can see that now it's no longer metastable, right? It gave off that extra energy right? So far, so good, right? So it's, it's really not bad. So all we're doing is we're just going to use this to try to figure out exactly what our, um, our mystery isotope is, right? So if I start with americium, americium-241 to be precise, like in our smoke detectors, and I tell you that it's an alpha particle emitter, can we figure out what is the mystery isotope? What's the daughter nuclide, if I want to be fancy, nuclide or just nucleus, right? So the daughter nuclide that's going to be created in this process. So 
it's gonna take a little bit of work, right? I'm gonna to have to figure out exactly um, what is going to be formed. So before we do that though, let's just switch this up for a minute. Okay, and let's go over here to my camera somewhere. Okay, and so what I've got is I've got just a deck of cards right here. And again, normally I'd have you go ahead and choose one, but I'm just gonna start flipping through that deck, okay? So I can stop wherever I want, right? Let's say stop there, okay? So if I were to do that, okay, I would see that, um, okay, that my card here is the seven of spades, okay? So that's my, my mystery um, isotope, right? Um, that's what I'm trying to figure out. Now, normally, um, you would only be able to see it, and I wouldn't know what it is, but it's actually pretty easy for me to figure it out because it's like an old-fashioned flip book, right? If I just start flipping through, you can see that it starts spelling seven of spades, right? Okay, and so then, therefore, it must be the seven of spades. It's a little hard to do that from this angle, but let's try that again. That's a little better. So seven of spades, right? So that's how I'd figure it out. And just like that's a really easy process for me to do, it's also a really easy process for me to go ahead and figure out what this mystery isotope is. So let's go ahead and try that. So um, what do I need to do? Well, first I need to make sure that this top number, it's a 241 on the left-hand side, right? So I need to make sure that the top numbers on the right also add up to 241. Now remember that instead of writing as alpha, I'm gonna go ahead and write that as a 4,2 helium nucleus, okay? Because that's gonna allow it to, you know, add up a little better, right? So I've got my mystery isotope right here, and I know that this top number has to add up to 241. So what must it be? Well, it's probably a 237, right? Because 237 plus four would be equal to 241, right? Simple. Okay, what about the bottom number? Well, I know that the bottom number needs to add up to 95, so this must be a 93 because 93 plus 2 equals 95, right? So I'm just adding these two numbers. I'm also adding these two numbers, making sure that they all cancel or, you know, come up to the same thing. So not bad. A little bit of basic, um, you know, addition or subtraction, I guess you can think of it as. Um, so now, what is this mystery isotope right here? Well, what I would need to do is I would go and look for element number 93 on my periodic table. And element number 93 happens to be Neptunium. Okay, so that's all I would do. I'd find out that it's called Neptunium, named after the, uh, um, let's see, that would be the Roman god of the sea, right, Poseidon. Anyway, so that's the idea. And so that would be my answer. I just figured out what my missing nuclide was, right? My daughter nuclide in this case. Let's try another one, okay? This time it's a beta particle emitter. So what do we rewrite beta as? A zero minus one E, okay? So I've got my mystery isotope right here. What's the top number going to be? Well, Looks like it needs to be a 32, because that way 32 plus zero would equal 32, which would match the left-hand side. Okay, what about the bottom number? Well, this one actually needs to be a 16, because 16 plus a negative one, right, equals 15. And that 15, of course, matches that number right there. So now I just go to my periodic table, look for element number 16, and element number 16 is sulfur. So that radioactive phosphorus I was working with in the lab was slowly turning into sulfur, okay, um, as it emitted beta particles. So I'm literally transmuting one element into another. I think that's cool. <laughs> All right, let's try another one. So cobalt, cobalt-60, also used in hospitals um, for radiation treatment. So this one gives off both beta and gamma. So I'm gonna to have to go ahead and um, use both of these, right? So beta, I'm gonna rewrite that as a zero minus one E. I've also got my mystery isotope here. And then gamma, remember gamma doesn't really change anything. It's just a zero, zero, and then a gamma symbol. So what's the top number? Well, 
Looks like it's got to be a 60 because 60 plus 0 plus 0 equals 60, right, which matches this number. What about that bottom number? Looks like that must be a 28 because 28 plus a negative 1 plus that 0 right there comes out to 27, okay, which matches that atomic number right there. So now I just go to my periodic table, look for element number 28 on that periodic table, and that is nickel. Okay, so as cobalt 60 decays, it's slowly turning into nickel, or nickel 60 to be precise. Okay, so pretty easy, right? Not too bad at all. Let me know if you have questions on it. I can always do more examples, but I don't think these ones are too bad. All right. Now, I mentioned that in the lab I would work with radioactive phosphorus, and that phosphorus is slowly decaying into sulfur, right? So um, how long does it take? Well, it turns out that um, there's something known as the half-life. And as the name implies, the half-life is how long it takes for half of your radioactive sample to decay. Right, to convert into something else, okay? So in this picture here, um, I could, you know, if this was my, my, um, my radioactive phosphorus, okay, I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight of these little atoms floating around. And the half-life, it turns out the half-life for um, phosphorus, P32, is about 14.1 days. Okay, so after 14 days, after about two weeks, I would now only have half of it. Notice I only now have four of these. I also have four of those sulfurs, right, that I just created. After another half-life, and after another 14.1 days, now instead of having four, I now have two, right? So I went from eight to four to two. After another two weeks, I'd have one. After another um, two weeks, I'd have half an atom. Now, of course, I can't have half an atom, right? But at that point, it would be gone, okay? Now, there is absolutely no way to change the half-life of radioisotope. So unlike a lot of chemical reactions where I could heat it up to speed it up, or I could cool it down, I could change the pressure, I could do all those things in a normal chemical reaction, but in a nuclear reaction like this, in a half-life reaction, um, it doesn't work. It's first-order kinetics, which means that um, it, there's nothing I can do about it, right? It just decays at a nice um, orderly rate. And if you go back to the chapter on kinetics, you can go back and refresh your memory on it, okay? So let's go ahead and just practice this. Um, let's say that I have, you know, an overactive thyroid. I go in for um, radiation treatment. They give me an iodine-131 pill, so it's radioactive iodine. Your body's really good at shuttling that iodine straight to your thyroid gland, and so then as it radioactively decays, it um, hopefully destroys the extra growth on my thyroid and makes me nice and healthy, right? Now, the half-life of iodine-131 is only eight days. I should also mention there's no way to know what the half-life is of something without either experimental data or um, looking it up, right? So I could look up the, the half-life of iodine-131's eight days, but there's no way to say, oh, iodine, yeah, hmm, eight days. I, I wouldn't know, right? Okay, so let's say that I have 100 milligrams of that. Okay, so after eight days... How much am I going to have now? Well, 50 milligrams, right? It's called half-life for a reason. After another eight days, how much do I have? Well, half of that, so 25 milligrams. After another eight days, I now have 12 and a half milligrams. And after another eight days, how much would I have? Well, about 6.25 milligrams of that stuff. And if I add this up, eight days, that would be 16, that's 24, that's 32. So after 32 days, I would have 6.25 milligrams of this stuff, okay? So pretty easy, right? Um, now let's try another one, okay? So I mentioned the half-life of P32 is about 14 days. We'll just round it to 14 days. So if I start with 24 grams, do I care that it's in grams rather than milligrams? No, okay? So after two weeks, 14 days, I would now have 12 grams of it. After another two weeks, I would have six grams of it. After another two weeks, I would have three grams of it. And if I add that up, two, four, that's six weeks, right? Six weeks, I'd have three grams of it left over, 
okay? After another two weeks, what would it be? Well, one and a half grams, right? And it would just keep going down from there. So that makes it really easy as long as the amount of time that you're looking at is, you know, a multiple of your half-life, right? So if I said what's, you know, the amount after six weeks or eight weeks or 10 weeks for P32, it would be easy. But what if I said, what's the half-life after like 70, you know, 1.36 weeks? Well, this isn't going to work, right? So instead, I would have to use an actual formula for that. And so here's the formula. This may look familiar because it's just from the chapter on kinetics, right? So um, what I would do is I would take the natural log of NT, which is the amount of, um, you know, stuff I have, my radioactive nucleus, nuclei, um, at time t, and then divide it by my initial amount, and then that's equal to negative kt. Remember that lowercase k, that's our rate constant. Um, since we're dealing with half-life, turns out that half-life is just 0.693 over k. This is just the natural log of 2, if you're wondering where that comes from. Um, so we, we could probably just rearrange this so that we can plug it in, right? So we can solve for k. So that's easy. k is just 0.693 over half-life, right? So that's probably a little more useful because now we can take this, plug it in here. If we know how much we started with, we can plug it in there, and then we can solve for um, how much we have at time t. Or I could be told how much I have at time t and then figure out how much I started with, right, after a given amount of time. Or I could have how much I started with, how much I end with, how much time has gone on, and then figure out the half-life from there. So I can give you any of you know, those. There's one, two, three, four variables in here, right? Um, and I could have you, you know, give you three and have you solve for the other one. So let's go ahead and try this. Let's say that I've got some radioactive argon, and I want to know how long it's going to take to go from 80 milligrams down to 10 milligrams. I'm given the half-life, right, 12 minutes, and I went ahead and wrote the formulas here just so that we don't have to keep flipping back and forth between these. All right, so let's go ahead and plug in what we know. So we know it's the natural log of n at time t. So how much is that? Well, at time t, we have 10 milligrams left. Okay, at time zero, we had 80 milligrams, right? That's what we started with. Notice that I actually don't care what my units are as long as they cancel out, right? So if they're both in grams, great. Both in nanograms, great. Picograms, great. Um, I just can't have like one in nanograms and one in milligrams. I would have to convert. All right. And then um, negative kT. All right. Well, uh, I don't know what k is, but I do know what the half-life is. And I know that k is just equal to 0.693 over the half-life. So k would be equal to 0.693 over 12 minutes, okay, so that's not too bad. Um, so let's see, is there anything else I need to worry about? Well, let's go ahead and just plug that in. So grab my calculator real quick, 0.693 over 12. So K is equal to 0 0.05775, and the units would be per minute. I wanted to be specific about that. Okay, so it's negative k, right? So it's a negative 0 0.05775 per minute times t. Okay, and at this point, I just need to solve for t. So I'm going to do the natural log of 10 over 80. I'm going to divide that by negative 0.05775, and it comes out to 36. And because this was per minute, my units here have to be in minutes. Okay, So um, this would be 36 minutes. Now, if the problem, for instance, wanted it in seconds, I would convert from you know, minutes to seconds or from minutes to hours or whatever. right? Um, but that's, that's how it would work. right? So not bad, as long as you know this formula and you know, this right here, just plug in everything, solve for the last one. Okay, not a bad chapter, huh? And this is actually what they do for
um, radio carbon dating. So if you've heard of carbon dating, not like match.com, right, but um, looking at how old something is, what they're actually doing is they're looking at the ratio of radioactive carbon-14 to stable carbon-12. What happens is that carbon-14 is actually created um, just from cosmic rays bombarding the nitrogen in the upper atmosphere or something, and then um, that creates some radioactive carbon-14. And then as we're, you know, plants take that in um, and incorporate that into cellulose and glucose, we as humans or other living creatures like to eat those plants, so then we incorporate that um, carbon-14 into us. And as long as we're alive, the ratio stays about constant, right? Because you're constantly consuming more plants and Pop-Tarts and stuff. And so you're basically replenishing how much carbon-14 is going into your body. You're also excreting some and so forth. But it should stay nice and constant. But once you die, you no longer intake any more carbon-14, right? Which means that the carbon-14 that is in your bones, for instance, is going to start decaying, radioactively decaying, or continue to radioactively decay, I should say, and turning into carbon-12. And so that ratio is going to start decreasing until eventually all the carbon 14 is gone and all you have is carbon 12. And at that point, you can't do car radiocarbon dating anymore because you don't know how old your sample is because there's no way to know if you know the amount of carbon 14 decayed like yesterday or a billion years ago, right? Um, now, this works pretty well for a lot of living things because the half-life of carbon-14 is about 5,730 years. So it does work pretty well for quite old things, um, but not for like fossils, for instance, because if they're millions of years old, all the carbon-14 is gone. Okay? Now, for things like that, you can, and for rocks and you know, stuff like that, you can look at radioactive potassium. and There's a bunch of other isotopes that you can look at and do the, the same basic idea as radiocarbon dating. You just have to look at different ratios, different half-lives. Okay? So let's say that um, I do have a fossil, okay? and it has a C14 level that's 69% um, compared to a living organism. Right? And I want to know how old is that thing, right? So I've got like a woolly mammoth bone or something. And so I compare that to like elephant bones nowadays, and I see um, that the ratio is only 69%, okay? So for this, we're going to use a slightly different formula. It's based on the stuff that we just did, right? Just, you know, manipulating those natural logs and so forth. But this is what it comes out to be. The fraction remaining is equal to 0.5 raised to the power of t over t one half. So your time over your half-life. So in this case, I know that my fraction is 69%, or in other, words, in other words, it's 69 out of 100, right? So if I started with 100 um, grams of C14, I now have 69, or in other words, it's just 0.69. So just change your percentage into a decimal. So 0.69, that gives me a fraction. It's equal to 0.5, and then raised to the T over the T one half. Okay, so T1 half, I have to look that up. Oh, it looks like it's 5730 years since it's carbon-14. Okay, so in that case, well, actually, let's work through this one by one just because unless you've taken math recently, you might not remember how to get that thing out of the exponent, right? Turns out that what we need to do is use logs or natural logs. It would work the same, but if we go ahead and do the log of 0.69, that's going to be equal to, it actually brings this whole thing down in the front. So it's going to be t over 5730. Don't worry, you don't really have to remember all your rules for logarithms. Um, just trust me on this. So that it equals log of 0.5. Okay. And so now that's pretty easy, right? Because I can go ahead and solve for that. I can plug in... Um, I can basically just rearrange things and solve for t at this point, right? Hopefully that's pretty easy. So if I do the log of 0.69, divide by the log of 0.5, and then multiply both sides by 5730 to get rid of this thing in the denominator, then it comes out to about 3067, okay? And to be precise, I should actually write that that's 3067 years. The units have to be the same thing as what my half-life was in. And so my fossil is about 3,000 years old. So not very old, right? Maybe a woolly mammoth or giant sloth or something like that, but it's definitely not a triceratops.
Now, you might say, how well does that carbon-14 you know, radiocarbon dating actually work? Um, well, it does make a couple of assumptions, okay? So one assumption is that we're assuming that the amount of carbon-14 in the atmosphere has remained relatively constant throughout time, okay? Um, probably not so true after the advent of the nuclear era because we've done open-air testing of nuclear bombs for some weird reason. We decided that was a good idea. And so we've actually created extra carbon-14 that's floating around nowadays. Um, but if we assume that it's stayed constant throughout time um, before that, then we can still use radiocarbon dating for old bones and you know pot shards and stuff like that. Um, the other thing we have to assume is that the organism is actually getting its most of its carbon from carbon dioxide, right? Because remember that the carbon-14 is created by carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, right? Um, which then gets incorporated into plants and then animals eat those plants. So that works pretty well. But there have been a few instances where um, they have found a few creatures that don't get their most of their carbon from the atmosphere, right? Or at least a significant portion from other sources. So I think it's things like um, uh, oysters or clams, right? The, uh, if I find an old clam shell at some uh, archaeological site, I could test it, right? But do clams actually get most of their carbon dioxide from the atmosphere? No, they actually get it mostly from like, um, you know, like the bicarbonate ions that are in the ocean. So they're incorporating a lot of that. And so they've actually had things where they they will radiocarbon date like a living oyster and find out that they think it's 20,000 years old. And it's obviously not. It's a living oyster, right? It's just that it's not getting its carbon-14 from the same source as what we expect, right? So something that, to keep in mind. Um, but it does work remarkably well otherwise. All right, so we, I've talked about how we measure this stuff. Um, we typically use like a Geiger counter, a Geiger-Muller counter. We could use a scintillation counter. There's a few other types of counters out there. But what they're doing is they're literally just measuring how rapidly something's decaying, right? So if I hold a Geiger counter over a piece of Fiesta ware with some uranium in there, it actually measures as each uranium atom decays and gives off an alpha particle, okay? And so I'm literally just measuring disintegrations per second. Now, um, that unit right there is named uh, Becquerel, after Henri Becquerel, who discovered radioactivity. Um, there's also another unit called the Curie, named after Marie um, and Pierre Curie, who, you know, Marie was um, Henri Becquerel's student and, you know, worked a lot on radioactivity. She didn't discover it, but she discovered two new elements, um, radium and polonium, and so there's a unit named after her. Now, one Curie is actually a lot. I mean, 3.7 times 10 to the 10th disintegrations per second. I would not want to be exposed to that much radiation. Um, in the lab, we typically measure things in millicuries or even microcuries. So that's what I would measure it in when I was using radioactive phosphorus. I would actually um, test my, my phosphorus sample, make sure that it had the proper number of microcuries of activity, and it was, you know, basically still had enough phosphorus in there for me to do my job. And if it had decayed too much, I couldn't use it. Um, we were using the, the radioactive phosphorus to tag DNA because we know that DNA has um, phosphate groups, right? So why not tag it with radioactive phosphorus? And then you can use that to kind of figure out where it is, like on a gel and so forth. All right. Now, those are useful units for um, measuring just how much radiation is actually occurring. But it doesn't really tell us what's going to happen with that radiation. So there are a couple of units that we can use for that. Um, one is rad, which is a radiation absorbed dose. So this is how much radiation is absorbed by one gram of a substance. So that's kind of useful, right? Because, um, but the problem is, is that different types of radiation have different amounts of energy, right? Like getting hit by an alpha particle, by a bowling ball, is a different amount of energy than getting hit by a, a baseball, right? A, like a beta particle. It also depends on what substance is absorbing it, right? Something like lead is going to be able to block, um, you know, a lot more radiation than something like water does, right? And so what they've now done is we now typically, at least in medicine, um, if you're worried about how much you're being exposed to, we use what's called REM, radiation equivalent for man, okay, and women. Um, but the idea here is that they've actually scaled it so that the amount of 
th it's the same. It doesn't matter what type of um, radiation you're being exposed to. It's all factored into that, right? So if I you know, was exposed to one rem of radiation, it tells how much damage was done to my tissue no matter what the source was, right? So they've already kind of factored that. So just out of, you know, f for fun, um, here's just some interesting information. This is not stuff that you need to memorize for a test or anything like that, but the average individual is exposed to about 0.27 rems of radiation, right, per year. It's so not a lot. Now, is that safe or dangerous? Well, they say that there's no safe level of radiation, and that's technically true because, um, you know, I could have like a, a little newborn baby that on their first breath, as they take that first breath in the doctor's office, you know, at the hospital, um, they happen to breathe in one atom of radon gas. And that radon gas could radioactively decay in their lungs, which then um, could cause damage. That damage could be at just the wrong place in the, the genome. And if it's not repaired, that can lead to cancer and the kid could die from taking one breath of air on planet Earth. Now, that's possible, right? Sad, but possible. Um, the odds of that actually happening, not very great, right? The, it's just not likely that that's going to happen. It's like the lottery, right? The more times that you, you know, play the lottery, the more tickets you buy, the more your odds go up that you're going to win. This is like a lottery of death, right? The more radiation you're exposed to, um, the greater your odds of actually dying from it, right? Okay, anyway, so there's no real safe level, but there are some pretty standard um, agreed upon things. So if, if we're looking at just a single dose of radiation, so like you walk into a room with like James Bond and James Bond opens up this briefcase and it exposes you to radiation. If you're exposed to up to about 25 rems of um, radiation all in one dose, still probably nothing would happen, right? For the vast majority of people. Okay, if it was somewhere between about 25 and 100, you'd get a temporary decrease in your white blood cell count, right? So your, um, your white blood cells were damaged um, and your immune system would be weakened, you know, temporarily, okay? If you're exposed to about, up to about 500, um, you can get radiation sickness, right? Nausea, vomiting, fatigue, and so forth. Again, most of the time you'd probably recover just fine, but you'd feel crappy for a while, okay? Now that 500 number happens to be what's called the LD50. This is the lethal dose for 50% of the population. So if James Bond exposed everyone, you know, I shouldn't say James Bond, it's probably trademarked and stuff, but um, super secret spy guy um, you know, walks in, opens up this briefcase and exposes a whole class of like you know, 50 people to um, this 500 rems of radiation all at once, half of us would be dead within um, 30 days. So within a month, 50% of that population would die. Okay. Um, if you upped it all the way to 600 rams, that's the LD100. That means that 100% of us would be dead within a month. So that's a pretty huge scale, right? I mean, considering that we're being exposed to 0.27, so like a quarter of a rem per year, and even up to 25 rem per single dose doesn't really do much damage we're pretty safe, right? Um, basically, the things that we should be worried about, number one thing, if you're worried about cancer, right, is in radioactivity, don't smoke, right? Um, there's a lot of actual radioactive material in tobacco, um, just because tobacco leaves are really good at absorbing some polonium and phosphorus radioactive materials from the soil and from the fertilizer, and then it stores it in the leaves, and then you go and smoke that, um, it turns out that if you smoke a pack and a half of cigarettes a day, which is what, 30 cigarettes a day, you're exposing your bronchial epithelial cells to the same dose of radiation as if you had three and a half chest x-rays every day of your life. And you're only supposed to get like one or two chest x-rays a year, right? So imagine three and a half per day. And that's just from the, the pure radioactive material in the cigarettes. That's not talking about carcinogenic materials or you know any of the other nasty stuff um, in there. So. Um, like, for instance, c cigarette smoking is actually the number one cause of lung cancer. Um, it's also the number three cause of lung cancer. Number one, because uh, from direct cigarette smoking. Number three, because of um, secondhand smoke. So definitely causes a lot of cancer. Other things that you should be aware of, 
um, to consider. Um, the number two cause of lung cancer is radon gas. So that's because there's a lot of uranium in the bedrock, that uranium radioactively decays into radon, which bubbles out of the ground because it's a gas. And if that gets trapped in your like um, basement, for instance, it's heavier than air, so it gets stuck down there. And then if you're living down in the basement and there's high levels of radon, you can get lung cancer from that. So not a bad idea to check your house, make sure that um, you're not poisoning yourself with radon. Um, let's see, what else? Uh, sun, right? Go, going out in the sun. That's not you know, radioactivity, but it's, also, it's still ionizing radiation. It's enough that can, can cause cancer. Anyway, all right, so enough about that. So radioisotopes can also do good things, right? If you go to the doctor, they can use radioactive xenon to test your lung function. You breathe in this radioactive gas, they scan it, um, and then see how your lungs are functioning. Technetium is used for bone scans, gallbladder functioning, GI bleeding. Um, I mentioned iodine is used for thyroid tumors and hyperthyroidism, radioactive phosphorus for leukemia and lymphomas. You don't need to memorize these or anything, but I just think it's cool that all these different radioisotopes have found some really good uses. Um, iridium is used in breast cancer. Um, this is interesting because iridium is a precious metal, right? It's about as expensive as platinum. Um, and so if, you know, if someone is complaining about the cost of like breast cancer treatment, it's because they're literally using, it's like using platinum for medicine, right? Very expensive. All right, thorium can be used for heart function testing, okay? And then another thing that um, is useful for radioactivity is fission and fusion. So fission is splitting apart a heavy nucleus into some lighter nuclei, and then it also gives off electrons. So we typically use this for, with uranium, right? We take uranium-235, put it in a nuclear power plant, and we hit it with a neutron. Now, uranium is already naturally radioactive, right? But we can help it along by hitting it with a neutron. When we do that, it actually ends up splitting the nucleus into, it turns out, krypton and barium. But the cool thing is it also produces three more neutrons. Those three neutrons then go speeding off where they can each go and hit another uranium atom. And each of those then splits and gives up three more um, neutrons, which can then go and do it again, right? And you get a chain reaction. It's called going critical, right? So at this point, it's a self-sustaining um, nuclear reaction where those neutrons will just keep going. Now, obviously, you don't want the neutrons to get completely out of control because then um, you have an atomic bomb, right, where um, it just keeps going and then um, that would be bad. But it turns out that um, they use control rods. They use um, things like heavy water to slow those neutrons. So a nuclear power plant, it's actually physically impossible, scientifically impossible for that to become a nuclear bomb, okay? Um, it's not like terrorists could go in there and you know, secretly steal the uranium and you turn it into a nuclear bomb. It's not going to happen. It's not possible, right? So please don't worry about that. Um, it's actually, nuclear power actually has this, the best safety record of any types of power in the last, like over the last 50 years. So even if you consider Fukushima, even if you consider Chernobyl, which were, you know, just some bad ideas there, um, which we can talk about another time, but um, even in those cases, even if you consider the people that died from those, more people have died from windmill accidents or from, you know, um, you know, damage from solar panels than have died from nuclear power. So it really is the safest form of power we have. Now, what's the problem with it then? If it sounds so great, well, you do have radioactive waste. So this waste is now radioactive. It's going to be radioactive for a long, long time. Now, is that really a problem? Well, not a huge problem considering that the uranium is already in the Earth's crust. So there's already uranium all around you all the time, right? And so it's not like you're really creating a whole lot of extra waste. You're just get, t gathering up all that uranium, radioactive uranium, and putting it all in one place. Typically nowadays, they just take the, the um, waste and they just store it you know, on site. And then after the reactor has served its, its meaningful lifespan, they just fill it all in with concrete. And now you've trapped all that radioactive material in this big vault of concrete, and it's safe, right? Um, Anyway, or they can store it in places like Yucca Mountain, just other options that they have. All right. Um, and it's also CO2 neutral, so if you're worried about 
climate change and stuff like that, uh, it's a, a pretty good idea to go towards nuclear power. All right, so that's fission. Produces a lot of heat, which then used to boil water, which then spins a turbine, produces electricity for us. Now, there's also fusion. Fusion would be even better. Fusion's what powers the sun. So fusion, you're fusing a couple of light nuclei together. So, for instance, you can take um, two different isotopes of hydrogen, deuterium and tritium, fuse them together, and all you get out is helium and a neutron, right? So if we had a fusion plant, the only waste we would have would be helium that we could use to fill up helium balloons and have a big party because now we've got sustainable, clean energy forever, and it would be wonderful. It produces even more energy than fission does, um, but the problem is you need to basically have a miniature sun, right, inside of your nuclear power plant. So the sun works because of all the gravity, right, pulls all of those atoms together, um, and then that allows it to fuse, to overcome the repulsion between these and fuse them together. Okay, you would somehow need to replicate that, um, and there is some some work being done on this by zapping it with lots of lasers and things like that, but um, currently it's not feasible, right? Maybe someday we'll have a, you know, a fusion reactor. Um, on Back to the Future, if you remember at the end, Doc Brown, he's got a little Mr. Fusion in the back of the DeLorean. He can just dump like eggshells and stuff into and fuse them together to get energy and then just produce helium in the process and sound like Mickey Mouse and it would be great, right? Um, but currently, that's not what we can do. All right, so that, I think, wraps us up for this chapter. Um, let me know if you have any questions.